and uh, welcome. And uh, we have got a certain uh, situation downstairs, which we in some ways here privately welcome, but which nevertheless means that we need to be a little bit more careful than usual. Uh, and I want to just say LSE Security and the team here have been also remarkably supportive uh, in regards to the situation downstairs, on which more in a moment. For the people who are here, in the event of a fire, in the event of a fire, there is an exit to my left and an exit to my right. As the chair of the event, I will obviously be the first to leave. <laughs> and uh, then there is the trick upon which your life may depend. There is only one exit from the building, and it is the one through which you came to enter. If you've forgotten which one it is, you had better pray now that there is no fire. But it's the same one. So don't scatter heading to exits that are locked. That's the fire warning. Over. And the second thing to say to you is that we will be winding up this event at 8 p.m., if not before. It's a longish run little under two hours. And we'll be asking you all, LSE and visitors, with the exception of the panel, we'll be asking you to exit the building. And the reason we'll be asking you to exit the building is because we are keen to introduce our panel to the second audience I wanted to welcome this evening. And that audience is downstairs and is watching and listening to this event now from the encampment which has been set up within this building in order to bring to our attention the unfolding disaster that is Palestine in general and Gaza in particular, and is a protest which has been entirely well behaved, extremely peaceful, and which is underpinned by a remarkable piece of student research which is about the need to disinvest from uh, certain parts of the capital system in which LSE is invested with a view to securing some level of justice in the management of our funds. It is an impeccable model of student activism. And we want the panel to meet and join them. And security have facilitated that. They've also facilitated the screens downstairs, no mean task, which required quite a lot of technological uh, engagement and which it would have been very easy to have avoided doing by declaring it to be beyond the expertise of the team. It's not beyond their expertise and they've done it. So the slight quid pro quo for that, if I may say, is that we respect their firm request to me to relay to you that they'd like you not to linger uh, and, and to move out so that we free up the space for our panel to have this interaction. We're going to get on to the speakers. You know a little bit about it, and we're going to hear more. I do want to say what many of you will know, and I want to say it not only to the audience here and the audience downstairs, but the audience, I was going to say at home, but we don't know where they are people who are not here, and, and an awful lot of people looking at us from afar, because uh, partly because of the uh, encampment, but more generally because of the sensitivity of the issue, the group here in front of me is restricted to LSE and named guests. So there's a lot of people watching, and I want to say welcome to that third group. But I want to just remind us of what I'm discussing. And then I'm handing over to the guests, and I'll introduce the first, and then sequentially, as the time comes, for them to speak. Gaza had lots of universities. Gaza had, and has, but they've all been severely damaged or destroyed by military action. Israel University, Al-Zahar University, the University College of Applied Sciences, the University of Palestine in Gaza, the Islamic University of Gaza, destroyed or damaged. Almost a hundred Palestinian academics have been killed in, in Gaza. Almost a hundred. Almost a hundred. 
including Professor Sufi Antaya, president of the Islamic University of Gaza, Dr. Saeed al zubda the president of the University College of Applied Sciences, Professor Rifat Alir, one of Gaza's most prominent intellectuals, dead. Meanwhile, uh, on, on the West Bank, the University of Berzait, uh, many of its staff and students have been detained, restricted in their academic activities. The vast number of deaths, vast number proportionate to the population and in absolute terms, should not be allowed to obscure the devastating impact on culture of the destruction of the university sector. And that's what we acknowledge today and what we want to discuss. Now, we start with a person whom it turns out, a person whom it turns out showed me around Bethlehem uh, some years ago. I think we'll be discreet. Some years ago. <laughs> And it's an enormous pleasure to welcome her. Uh, and that's Ms. Reem al Buckman from Berzait University. Now, Reem is director. When I met her, she was some junior person in this. But she's now the director of the Institute of Law at Berzait University. She's assistant editor of the Palestinian Yearbook of International Law. She's co-author of the NSC Middle East report, Palestinian Everyday Life Within and Without Legality. And Andreem is going to give us, over a period of 10 to 15 minutes or so, a report from Berzait. So I, I think this is uh, remarkable that we have her here. I'd like to uh, remind her of the three audiences that are going to be watching and listening, and invite her to take the floor wherever she wishes to take the floor to start our evening off. Thank you. Everybody. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, LSE and the Faculty of Law Human Rights Center for putting together this event. Uh, I would like to thank Luke for uh, uh, bringing us here and for doing all the effort uh, uh, to that regard. Uh, secondly, I would like to extend my respect to the LSE students in Canton. I will tell them that your voices is heard everywhere in Palestine, uh, and you are uh, uh, a message. Uh, you are uh, uh, bringing hope and determination. Your solidarity and activism sends a powerful message that racism, injustice, and oppression will not be accepted. So uh, I will be talking today about the situation in Palestine, and particularly in relation to. Uh, uh, higher education and uh, things that we face uh, in higher education in general. Uh, this uh, discussion about academic freedom occurs amidst, amid serious attempts to intentionally silence the voices of the oppressed and those in solidarity with them. It also occurs amidst the evident complicity with the genocidal evidence, uh, a genocidal violence committed by settler colonial states and their structures of power. Uh, it is vital to recognize the role of the academia and academics institution that plays a relation to the crimes currently being committed in Gaza. Concepts are tools that can be utilized to shape narrative, influence perception, and potentially perpetuate or challenge these injustices. The demand of the student bodies and academic unions worldwide, which have issued statements of solidarity with the Palestinians and called uh, uh, for the boycott and divestment from Israel, reflects an understanding of the importance of academic integrity, liberty, and justice 
connecting us all in struggle. Yesterday, the Palestinians commemorated 67 years of Nakba, catastrophe. The current genocidal violence in Gaza reveals the clear continuity of injustice that occurred 760, uh, 76 years ago and continue to this day. This violence highlights the genocidal nature of the settler colonialism and its practices aimed at the elimination and displacement of the Palestinians from their land and the destruction of those, their social and cultural life. After 225 days of war against the Palestinian people in Gaza, the Israeli occupation our, uh, army has utilized all kinds of colonial violence. Around 35,000 Palestinians have been killed by the Israeli occupation army. And hospitals, schools, universities, libraries, bakeries, museums, archives, and infrastructure, electricity, water, have been destroyed almost entirely. The aim, as during the Nakba, is to eliminate both the present and the future of the Palestinian people in Palestine. Uh, a key difference between the Nakba and the current situation in Gaza is that today the violence is broadcast worldwide. No one can claim ignorance about what is happening. The whole world is witnessing these atrocities in real time. Then and now, international law and human rights discourse have been both utilized by the powerful to exclude and perpetuate injustice against the Palestinians, despite the backdrop of the promises to liberate humanity and to eliminate oppression. The only way to achieve this promise is to engage critically with these abstract norms in favor of international and human rights discourses that have political effectiveness in achieving justice and eliminating oppression. This can only be achieved through solidarity in the struggle against colonialism, colonialism and its utilization of norms in favor of its project. I'm saying so because it's difficult actually to be a professor of human rights in Palestine. I mean students would be asking a, a lot of questions about uh, what is the political effectiveness of these norms, why we're using them, what is the purpose of their existence if, if this is not going to be implemented on the question of Palestine and the Palestinians are excluded from the implementation of these norms. On the contrary, students are describing the relationship between these norms and the Palestine question as something that is being utilized against uh, the Palestinian history and legal history, and maybe my friend Nimer will be talking about it, uh, uh, shows uh, uh, that uh, uh, clearly. In my presentation, I will focus on the right to education in Palestine under the colonialism and provide an account of the colonial violence and destruction of the Palestinian educational institution. The Palestinian higher education sector is not a typical sector of education. Besides its role in contributing to intellectual debates and polishing the, skill of the skills of the students, it plays an essential role under colonialism. Specifically, it functions as a vital sector in manufacturing hope. It fosters hope for a just future free from subjugation and oppression. Enable existential survival. It supports the indigenous people of Palestine, survival as a community with its own social, cultural, and political characteristics providing a, f a f platform for, art for articulation and imagining a, a free Palestine, defending uh, and defiance against isolation, in defiance of the Israeli isolation of the Palestinians, local initiative within the occupied territory initiated the establishment of higher education system. I mean, it was not after 1948 and 67, there were no higher education institutions in Palestine. It was established after that. And the, the, the people in Palestine were left in isolation and uh, they, were, they need to go abroad to Syria, Lebanon, and in order to study. So the role of the Palestinian higher education system is not uh, the usual one in relation to uh, these aspects. Through these functions, the Palestinian high, higher education sector became a cornerstone in the struggle of justice, self-determination, and resilience against colonial forces. 
Palestinians consider higher education as fear where power, agency, and resistance are understood. It allows them to learn from experiences of other earlier colonized people and to build relations of solidarity and alliances on just progressive, non-racist, non-sexist grounds with communities around the world. As such, education is seen as providing critical, theoretical, and epistemological approaches to understanding the colonial foundation of their dispossession as well as the means to overcome settler colonialism. In this context, the Right to Education campaign was created in Palestine as a grassroots campaign led by academics and students. The campaign was launched in 1988 during the first uprising in Palestine as a product of the long history of activism, activism at Birzeit University in response to ongoing repression of Palestinian education institution by the Israeli uh, apartheid system. The campaign operates with a clear vision. The right to education is a fundamental pillar to reach the rest of our human rights as Palestinian, and it is a tool for resisting Israeli settler colonialism. And Israel has systematically devised policies and measures to control, disrupt, and undermine the Palestinian higher education sector and education as a whole. These mechanisms has, have varied over the years, but all aimed at crushing the spirit of education as a vehicle of emancipation and from domination. In Gaza, from the early days of the war, Israel targeted educational institution. By November, it would have destroyed six out of seven univers universities in Gaza. All 19 higher education institutions have been destroyed, more than 94, 100 academics being killed, hundreds of students murdered, and 88,000 students left without education. Academic terms in this particular type of this, uh, term, this particular type of destruction, well before the current war, as scholasticide pointing to the destruction of Gaza's educational infrastructure, academics, and students in 19, 2014. Assaults on universities in Gaza, in Gaza and the West Bank include serious harassment and attacks on senior faculties and students supporting Palestine within, as well as students supporting Palestine within the Israeli university system. During the 9, 2014 onslaught on Gaza, Israel shelled kindergartens, schools, and several higher education centers. Student death caused by the Israeli shelling made up more than quarter 28% of the total civilian deaths in Gaza. This was in 2014. The UN, UN report revealed that the higher education institutions were attacked by Israeli drones, strikes, high explosive anti-tank weapons, and directly and indirectly airstrikes placing students and lecture on the front line of the conflict. Israeli measures during the uh, 67 years of uh, uh, Nakba, continuous Nakba, included ma military closure of campus, ranging from four days to uh, 1,571 days, as in like four years and a half almost. The Israeli occupation forces regularly stormed and raided university campus. Birzeit was raided three times since October. On March the 7th, for example, 2008, an undercover Israeli unit entered Birzeit University and kidnapped two students, Omar Kiswani, a 24-year-old political science student, and a student council president. On March 26, 2019, the same unit infiltrated Birzeit University and kidnapped three students. On January 10, 2022, Israel forces fired live bullets at students at the eastern uh, entrance of the university, injuring one and arresting five, all part of the students' movement. Raids occurred on September 24th and November 7, and the last raid took place on February 22. Yesterday, while I'm coming to uh, London, uh, one of our students, uh, Asir uh, Aysar Safi, he was killed by the Israeli uh, army uh, yesterday. His funeral was in the university yesterday. Today, my university is closed. 
uh, because of that. I mean, and uh, this is not the only student that got killed. We have 30, I mean, in my, uh, uh, there are 33 now, we count it as 34 students, students being killed in uh, Birzeit alone. So you have to see in other universities how many students get to be killed in, uh, 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 on raids and attacks and outside the university and inside it. Imprisonment and death of the students and academics. Since 1982, more than 2,000 students from Birzeit University have been imprisoned by the Israeli occupation. We have now more than one, uh, 130 students, two academics, and two staff members are in the Israeli prisons with 60 arrested after October 7, and 40 under administrative detention without trial. Today, today, but yesterday, there became 34 Birzeit students have been murdered by the Israeli occupation. Through these brutal measures, Israel aims to undermine the Palestinian legal education sector. But, but despite this, the sector remains a critical space of resistance, hope, and fight for justice. <clears throat> Students in prisons face interrogation and arrest. And you have to see uh, the pictures of the students and our colleagues who entered the prison six months ago and the way they look after six months. They lost 25 kilos each. They uh, describe the situation in prisons as inhumane. They put like 80 uh, people in the same uh, room. They share a small amount of food. So they're being inside the prisons as well, uh, 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 facing a lot of uh, uh, humiliation and uh, 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 bad condition. Complicity of Israeli universities. It is important when we talk about the Palestinian education sector is actually to highlight the complicity of the Israeli universities in, uh, with the Israeli colonial regime, with the settler colonialism and apartheid. They are involved in developing weapons, systems, and military doctrines deployed in the Israeli recent war crimes in Gaza, justifying the ongoing colonialization of Palestinian land Rationalization, rationalizing gradual ethnic cleansing of the indigenous Palestinians, providing a moral justification for extrajudicial killing, systematically discriminating against non jew students, and other implicit and explicit violation of human rights and international law. It is important to end this complicity in Israeli violation of uh, international law and Palestinian civil society has called for an academic boycott of the complicit Israeli academic institutions, refusing to normalize oppression. Many academic associations, student governments, and, un and, un and unions, as well as thousands of international academics, now support academic boycott of Israel. While the Israeli army is committing uh, several crimes against the Palestinians that fall within the preview of war crimes, genocide, apartheid, and crimes against humanity, to name a few. We, we reiterate that it is crucial to place these measures within a wider framework of the occupation of Palestine and blockade of Gaza that happened for 17 years. Uh, the Israelis built an infrastructure of violence in Gaza the way they used electricity, uh, the way they used water, uh, the way they blockaded Gaza for 17 years was a tool, uh, a genocidal tool from the beginning. As a Palestinian and national political rights are denied, including the right to exist, resist, and return, and most importantly, the right to self-determination, Israeli university ha universities have a long history 
of actively supporting Israel regime of military occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid. It is important, and as we can see, that the Palestinian narrative is being targeted by the Israeli system, by the Israeli regime. And because of that, they're targeting educational institutions. What get to be destroyed in Gaza is not just the university, it's the whole history of Palestine. They're destroying not only and killing people, professors, students, uh, and their families, actually, they're wiping families from the uh, civil registration system. They are also destroying archives, museums. They're looting, they have looted an Isra University Museum, 3,000 uh, uh, artwork and uh, documents and archived uh, uh, materials have been looted from Al Isra University Museum during this work. There is nothing left for uh, the educational system or its institution. There is no resources anymore within the Israeli, uh, within the Palestinian academic uh, system in Gaza. Despite that, people are still resisting all these uh, aspects of uh, subjugation and oppression. And despite that, they're trying to build hope. We have at Bir Zayt an initiative called Rebuilding Hope. It's regarding the rebuilding of the Palestinian system in Gaza. Uh, all that being destroyed is going to be built again. But the students, uh, the, the um, uh, professors at Bir Zayt are contributing they started already in May, early May. They started uh, teaching uh, students from Gaza, the ones who are capable of uh, attending the classes, because there is no internet sometimes, and you know, it's a war situation. Not necessarily they're able to attend uh, these classes, but the, stu the professors are recording these classes and sending them to the students whenever they have the time. They will be uh, 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 attending uh, these classes. So this is a way not actually to provide uh, education and knowledge. It's actually a way to keep uh, the system running, to keep hope. And that's the role of the universities in general in Palestine. It's a way to resist all this oppression. It's a way to resist all these measures that have been taken by the Israeli uh, forces. And it's a way to survive and to build a new future. You know, what's happening in Gaza, they're destroying the ability of the people to live their future. They're destroying all essential element of life. They're destroying food access. They're destroying universities, which represent an education system, which represent the future of the Palestinian people. And they're destroying everything that they can reach to. Uh, so it's a total destruction of uh, the society. And now, with the access to uh, uh, Rafah, with what's happening in Rafah now, uh, uh, is going to be even worse because the people who were displaced and uh, to Rafah now, they're moving back again to the north and to Khan Yunus, and there are no uh, uh, place to go to. And the situation uh, in these, after destroying their houses and the institution, is not actually livable. Uh, I will stop here and that will okay. leave it. Thank you. Uh, but let me let me say that it's important to uh, for scholars and academics to support uh, the Palestinian uh, system. The support can be, be multifaceted approach that could address uh, in one way or another the gravity of the situation in Palestine that should actually make what is available in hand in terms of norms and regulations and human rights effective politically or politically effective. It's important to call for ceasefire. It's important to call for divestment. Uh, uh, these are tools that is available in the hand of people in the universities and elsewhere. It is the thing that you're going to be asked about in the future, why you were silent. You cannot be silent in the face of crimes. 
this is an important aspect uh, of support in terms of uh, how to end uh, uh, this genocide that is happening in, Ga in Gaza. It, it requires the work of everybody to do so. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted you delayed the end of your speech by a paragraph, so that was really powerful. Uh, I, I should say that we're going to have quick fire presentations of three colleagues, I'm going to introduce them, but then we're going to have discussion. And I rather think that we should participate actively in the discussion. So I, I don't know if it needs to be necessarily question and answer, though there'll be lots of answers. Uh, I think it should be reflections on hope. Listen to Reen, you know, about the boycott. How do you preserve hope? What is the role of the university sector? Uh, the role of human rights. Is it good, bad? Is it valuable? So let's, you're a community of interested parties, and, and let's share our views as well as ask, of course, ask our questions. I think, I say looking at my colleagues, that we're not taking questions remotely. Is that right? Uh, if you've got time, we can. We can, right, okay. But I'm, I'm primarily depending on the room, with apologies to you guys outside, and if the facility is there, do send questions in and we might pick some up. But I want the room to lead on the discussion after. And uh, we're carrying it on now. We're shifting to commentary. Uh, we're uh, privileged to have our next speaker, uh, Safa uh, Sadi Yabar, who is a candidate for the SJD at Hamad bin Khalifa University. HBKU, the College of Law in Doha, Qatar. And uh, Safa, just to my right, is from Gaza and is developing a doctoral project on international law. So I think it's extraordinary we have a person who has direct experience of Gaza and who is pursuing a doctorate in international law. So, Safa, with renewed thanks for coming, the floor is yours. So, um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Luke for inviting me and Dr. Fatima for nominating me for this event. It's my pleasure uh, to speak in front of you alongside uh, esteemed professors and scholars. I'm, I'm still a student here, speak, speaking mixed of all of you. It's uh, something that I got nervous. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I just want to emphasize many of the points that Dr. Reem has already mentioned. Uh, Dr. Reem is receiving um, questions from her students but I'm kind of a generation um, Z, so I'm receiving memes um, <laughs> that uh, I feel uh, as useless as international law. And just I'm, I'm not international law, guys. I'm a Palestinian like you. I'm Gazan. So I would like first to introduce myself. My name is Safa Jaber, uh, an SGD student at Hamad bin Khalifa University. Um, I was born and uh, I was uh, raised in, in Gaza Strip, uh, specifically Rafah. Um, whenever I, before, whenever I introduce myself, I'm saying I'm from Rafah. Literally, no one's, no one in the world know, know wh where's Rafah? I'm saying it, everybody knows Gaza, but no, nobody knows uh, Rafah. So I'm starting introducing and saying, Rafah is um, a very small city on the border between Palestine and Egypt. It's an ancient city. It has a history and it's trying to let, let, the, let people know more about Rafah. Uh, but after what happened now, I wish that nobody knows about Rafah. Mm -hmm. um, so although I was uh, raised in Gaza Strip, I am a refugee. Um, I'm a refugee in Gaza, so my grandfather were expelled from our lands in 1948. And a few weeks ago, my family were also expelled from Rafah. So I'm a refugee for the second time. 
and um, since 1948 we've been struggling and calling for our freedom and calling for having a normal life, just a normal life as anybody else. So I feel privileged to be here today um, because this is not a chance that every Gazan academic or student would get due to the restrictions on movement that we had since uh, more than 70 years ago. Uh, so it's very hard for students, for academics to go out and in Gaza. So I think Nisreem, like, shed the light on what's happening after October. Um, I would just like to share, like, from more personal experience, uh, what's been going before October 7 and before what's um, the genocide uh, happening for over than 70 years Gaza has been under blockade isolating its academic community from the world this isolation make it hard for Gazan academics to participate in international conferences competition exchange programs or even pursue um, a higher education abroad and this is not the case only since 2007 it's before since the second intifada erupted since the 20s like um, we were have restriction on freedom to get into and out Gaza I was telling Ms. Reem that I ha I was like dreaming to study um, in Birzeit University and the West Bank which is the other part of Palestine which is only 100 kilometers uh, away from from my city so because of the restrictions uh, uh, on the academic freedom for students i i wouldn't be allowed to go to the west bank and study because if i want to study there i have to get um, uh, a permission from the israeli authorities to get into and there are many cases uh, there were many cases for gazan students appealing to the Israeli courts to get this permission and every time the court were referring to the Israeli authorities that they have the freedom to ban or allow anybody to cross by Israel or Palestinian occupied uh, territories uh, to study in the West Bank. So it's not only being isolated uh, from the world, we are isolating from the rest of, of Palestine. Um, and I think also one of the challenges for academia uh, during the blockade, it's also the lack of equipment, the lack of research capacity for academics. Um, and because I don't know if you know that since the, the, the early years of blockade over Gaza, there were a list of what is not allowed to enter Gaza. And this list was so, so extensive to the limit that it's easier to know what is allowed rather what is not allowed to, to enter Gaza. So the equipment, for especially for technical fields and for medical fields, uh, were very hard to, to get into, um, into Gaza. Um, I think moving to what's going on uh, now, um, currently, it's a systematic targeting for universities, students, academics. And like the question is why you know like why why you are destroying universities why you are targeting academics i think we were raised as palestinians to say that knowledge is the only way to survive you have to get your degree otherwise you don't have any option you have to fight you have to fight and to resist through knowledge through education and this belief that's why we have many passionate aca academic that they are like willingly want to invest in Gaza many of them left to many students left Gaza to to study abroad in the UK in the US but guess what they are coming back to Gaza although they know that there there are no opportunities there are they are not um, paid well for them, maybe academics, maybe for months they don't have their salaries in, in Gazan universities. 
So, but they are coming back. And this is the question that we believe that education is the hope for us to survive and to fight back in our struggle. And that's why they are targeting academics and universities. And I want to mention that doesn't mean that being an academic, that you are more important than any other Gazan uh, have been killed in this uh, uh, genocide. I, as a, as a Gazan, all of, all of the people that we lost are equal and we believe that all of them um, have the right to, um, to life. So I just want to conclude by saying, I'm, I'm still young, so it's my second year in a PhD. I'm still new to academia. I'm shaking, standing next to all of you. It's just like, okay, they're all of professors and academics. I'm still young. I was surprised. I was shocked after the, the genocide erupted. And there was, you know, many ac academics were standing in gray areas. They are in between. They cannot say we are with or against. And I was disappointed that after 76, uh, 67 years as a Palestinian, I have to explain the ABCDs of the Palestinian cause for academics. For academics, they are the, the most, the well-educated people, the most knowledgeable people that we know. They know politics, history, ethics. They teach us, they teach us, they don't only, you know, they teach us what I have to explain the struggle for them. For me, the conclusion, for, for the reason of this, that there, there, there were and there have been a long-standing restriction on academic freedoms, academic freedom for academics to talk about Palestine within the academic sphere. It has been very long restrictions for pro-Palestinians to speak up and to criticize and to discuss their opinions. That's why it took more kind of eight months for student movements to, to be matured. Um, and I think it's very important for academic, uh, academic staff and professors to have a clear moral positions and what's going on. There is no gray area. It's to be or not to be. So in conclusion, it's time more than any time before to question um, the academic integrity, the academic institution that we are living under. Um, it's time to question our paradigms and to question the, the system that we are living under. And I want to quote uh, Virginia Woolf invited us to do, let us never cease from thinking, what is this civilization in which we find ourselves? What are these professions and why we should make money of them? Where, in short, it's leading us. The, bro the, bro the, the, pro the progression of the sons of educated men. I will invite all of you not to only have dry words, but to have a brave actions. Dry words wouldn't count for change. Only brave and strong academics would stay for the history. It's the way to be or not to be. Thank you. If, uh, if that's you, extremely nervous, <laughs> anxious, intimidated, may I advise you to retain that state of anxiety, <laughs> nervousness, and intimidation, because it's serving you very well in your, in your future life in a rebuilt Gaza. That was, that was devastating. Uh, a Dr. Luke was mentioned at the start, and he will be mentioned again. Uh, and I just want to pay tribute to Dr. Fadna, who was mentioned at the start as well, a former student of mine, an academic who has been instrumental in, as it were, securing your presence. So thank you. There she is, Fadna. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you.
Uh, we have two more, and uh, we're moving now a bit more to the particular. We have heard, as it were, from a couple of shocking front lines, and that set of remarks about the role of the academic needs to linger in our minds, uh, uh, and we need to reflect on it, perhaps, in our discussion. But we move to Rafif, I think, is next. Isn't that right? Rafif Ziada, who's senior lecturer at King's College. Uh, your focus, uh, Rafif, centers on political economy, gender, race, in particular the Middle East and East Africa. Now your PhD is from York University in Canada. And uh, in addition, I'm skipping other bits, if you don't mind. <laughs> in addition to being an academic, uh, Rafif is a poet and performance artist who has completed a tour of Ireland in which she sold out the Abbey Theatre. So I am actually pretty envious <laughs> of the following contributor wearing her academic, and we hope we can persuade her to wear a bishop or poetic, poetic hat. Over to <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here, and thank you to the organizers. Um, I know how difficult it has been to put on events like this at British universities. I have had my own run of security meetings, risk assessments, etc., to just be able to speak about Palestine. So thank you so much for creating the space and opening up the space for this conversation. Greetings to the encampment. We are very proud of you and we stand with you and I'm so glad this conversation is happening at the encampment as well. The genocide in Gaza has really put up a mirror to academic institutions in the West. We are all really questioning the very core of our educational institutions. Since October, I've been asking myself, what are these spaces that we teach in? What type of education are we providing? What kinds of spaces are they, practically speaking? It's a moment that pushes us to critically examine the narratives Western universities have peddled about diversity, decolonization, and civic duty. After all, we are told that our students should be engaged citizens. They should care about the world, unless it's about Palestine. Remember with me how swiftly these same institutions rallied to speak out about the situation in Ukraine. We had rallies and statements from leaders of these universities, rightly so. We had statements about Black Lives Matter movement, rightly so. Yet, when the spotlight shifts to Palestine, we have a very different tune. Suddenly, neutrality becomes the mantra. I have never seen so many statements about neutrality from universities in my life. In the midst of a televised genocide, where universities, schools, academics, hospitals, doctors, and lives are being shattered on our TV screens, universities claim neutrality. It's as if they believe that they exist in a vacuum, untouched by the world around. To proclaim neutrality in the face of this brutality is to actually be complicit in the suffering. It's an abdication of the moral duty that universities should uphold to stand for justice, to speak out against oppression, and to defend the rights of the oppressed. And even if we were to entertain this idea of neutrality, even if we were to fully believe in liberal values and agree that universities should never take a stand on anything, that somehow we float above society and shouldn't care, that all of that material about decolonizing the curriculum and standing up for justice and civic duty, if all of that were true, we cannot even look at the reality and still accept that they are neutral. These academic institutions are not impartial observers. They are deeply entrenched in partnerships with military companies. Up and down this country, the contracts with the military establishment and military private corporations are clear for all to see. 
these same universities forge alliances with their Israeli counterparts and academic institutions that Azrim has very clearly outlined are actively participating in the ongoing oppression of the Palestinians in multiple ways. Picture this. While Gaza schools and hospitals are being reduced to rubble, while there is a starvation policy against the population, while people in Rafah are being displaced for the third and fourth time in some instances, universities are striking deals with military giants that profit from the very weapons that are reigning this destruction. This is not neutrality. This is an egregious betrayal of what it is to be a university. And this, of course, is directly linked to the marketization of education, which we must continue to reject where universities become profit-seeking entities, our students become ATM machines, and forging alliances with corporations, bidding for the highest bidder becomes how our universities operate. So in this case, if all we are are corporations, if we sell degrees to the highest bidders and we forge alliances with these corporations, then what distinguishes these brands from Amazon or BAE? Are we just selling a product, a commodity? Maybe, maybe what distinguishes us are the few academics and students who still believe that education is not about profits, who still believe in notions that academia could be about justice and about a better world. Maybe it's actually the students in the encampments around the world that are saying no to genocide. Maybe they are the last hope for what a university is and what a university should be. For years now, the word decolonizing has been used. Diversity, inclusion. God knows I have sat on my share of diversity and inclusion committees. And I have discussed how we can hire more people of color, how we can have our curriculums be more diverse, but scratch beneath the surface and the facade quickly becomes obvious. It's actually becoming very insulting that our very identities, our skin, our last names are used and then reduced to marketing ploys when they are helpful. We are the faces of marketing brochures when they need to say, look, we, have, we are colorful. But then, when we ask them to stand for justice, to stand on the right side of history, we are met with silence. I work in an institution where 172 academics petitioned the university to just speak to us, to engage in a dialogue about ethical divestment. Didn't hear a word. We wrote letters, didn't hear a word. The students petitioned, we didn't hear a word. What we got was a policy on impartiality. That was the response to all the petitioning in the face of a genocide. But even worse, Palestine organizing itself becomes suspect. And today we are speaking about academic freedom and the destruction of Gaza's university. But this is part and parcel of the destruction of academic freedom everywhere. Because to destroy Gaza, the Israeli state wants us to be silent all around the world and wants complicity all around the world. So Palestine events then become suspect, and the word discomfort is bandied around. We don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. You shouldn't mention Palestine because someone might be uncomfortable. And here, I just really want to say something about this idea of discomfort as a silencing tool, because I do find it the most insidious, because we are supposed to make everyone feel comfortable, and we are supposed to have empathy. But. If the presence of a tent and some pictures of watermelons on campus unsettles you more than an actual genocide unfolding where human beings are dying, then perhaps, perhaps it's not the actions of students that should trouble you, but rather your own conscience and what you're willing to accept. And perhaps this discomfort in this context can be an opportunity for growth an opportunity to question the narratives that you have been told, an opportunity to actually learn about Palestinians from Palestinians.
We have, of course, seen much police brutality in evicting students from campuses. We have seen this from Germany to the Netherlands to the US. Riot police always eager to use their latest weapons, their latest toys, and deploy them against students. But there are other tactics of silencing as well. And I think, I have to say, I think British universities have really learned the art of more pleasant silencing, uh, insidious and quiet silencing. Maybe it's less visible, but it's also quite effective. These institutions have perfected the art of evicting undesirable narratives through quiet, polite measures. They wield bureaucratic silencing tools with finesse, drowning out voices in a sea of paperwork. Anyone who has filled a risk assessment form will understand what I am talking about. The fact that you have to actually use a risk assessment form in itself, the fact that if an event is about Palestine, it is flashed and flagged and you have to do a risk assessment form. And by the way, none of us actually know the procedure for these risk assessments. We just know that we have to fill out these forms. So we, for, we fill the forms. We have to convince the managers. We have to speak to everyone from catering managers to managers of media, of media and social media to convince them that we will be polite. We're not going to be angry. We will be pleasant. We just want to speak about Palestine. And of course, there are always committees to navigate. I have learned very slowly, I think, that the art of British bureaucracy was the art of empire and continues to be the art of the <laughs> university. Events meant to shed light on the history politics of Palestine are buried in committees. This is how British universities choose to grapple with genocide by shrouding it in layers of bureaucracy and administrative indifference, effectively rendering it invisible. We are meant to thank them if they allow an encampment, but we are not here to be thankful for being allowed to have the very right to freedom of expression that we already should have. We are here to actually point out that they are complicit and that their silence is complicity, but also their investments are complicity. By perpetuating a culture of bureaucratic inertia and administrative obstructionism, they become complicit in the very injustices they claim to be impartial observers of. So it's time to expose these quiet measures for what they truly are, tools of oppression wielded by institutions that have really lost sight of their moral compass of why they exist in the first place. So I am with the students, and I am with the academics up and down the country that have started to pledge boycotts, divestments, and sanctions. It is time for accountability <coughs> and transparency, just as the student encampments are calling for. So I refuse. I refuse to be the color on your brochures so you can claim decoloniality. I, push, I refuse to be your marketing ploy. I refuse to be the face of decolonization when you are not decolonizing anything. I refuse because one, we are the university. Two, we won't be silent. Three, disclose, divest now. Lastly, it's crucial to address the stance of some universities who advocate for supporting the rebuilding of Gaza's educational institutions while conveniently sidestepping their own complicity. And of course now, when you do finally manage to get a meeting with a university manager, they tell you, oh, we will invest in rebuilding Gaza's universities once everything is over. We're not going to speak now, we're going to be quiet now, but eventually we really strongly support the rebuilding and we will have partnerships because, you know, that's what we're supposed to do in the university, build partnerships. And they're quick to, re to discuss these rebuilding efforts without acknowledging their own complicity in the devastation to begin with. Yes, there is an absolutely an urgent need for rebuilding, but it must happen on Palestinian terms. This isn't an opportunity for the wholesale takeover of the Palestinian educational system by Western universities, seeking to reshape the curriculum and mold Palestinian education in their own image. Palestinian education has been built slowly over years by Palestinians. It is what we have come up with after years of Nakba and dispossession to be able to build these institutions 
has taken time, effort, political prisoners, education, years of people suffering to make sure that they get the education and be able to impart it again. This is not a chance to sell out Palestinian educational system to venture capitalists to exploit, or all those trying to say that it is best left to non-Palestinians to do the education. And already, the think tanks and the big NGOs are starting to speak about it. So before this comes a reality, we need to advocate for supporting Palestinian education. This has to be unequivocal, but it has to be done on anti-colonial grounds, real anti-colonial grounds. And once more, let me end by saying that we must refuse. There's no time for polite neutrality anymore. Every university in Gaza is in rubble. This is the time to actually take a moral stand. And Safa was saying she was nervous. I wish half the academics I know could have the strength and dignity you have to stand up here and say the truth and actually say there is no gray area. So let us refuse. We are the university. We won't be silent. We are simply asking this close divest. This is the least they can do, not the most they can do. Thank you. Yes. Uh, is the facade collapsing in front of our eyes? Another thought as we move into the discussion point. We've got a fantastic speaker to round up the platform. Uh, <clears throat> Nemo Sultani, I was thinking, Nemo, uh, and I don't want to steal one of your lines, but on calling a spade a spade comes to mind. Uh, comes to mind. Can anybody just say what's going on comes to mind? And uh, I'm, I'm immensely impressed by Nemo's writing, which I've read a lot of. I am in awe of his patience in deconstructing the language that we've been discussing critically this evening. Neymar uh, is, I'm told, also has a degree from Harvard Law School. And you, you've, got a, you've got a British Academy Fellowship. This guy is top dollar orthodox. <laughs> he ticks all the boxes. He's even got, and I think he must have made this up, an OUP book. This man is a cliche of academic advancement. Law and revolution legitimacy and constitutionalism after the Arab Spring. And he even claims to have won the Peter Burks Prize for Outstanding Legal Scholar. I'm beginning to disbelieve most of this. <laughs> but we'll, we'll collude in it. Uh, and we'll collude in it because uh, he's a terrific speaker and it's all true. And he's the interim chief of the Palestinian Yearbook of International Law. And he was once director of the political monitoring project in the Arab Center for Applied Social Research. And he winds up the platform presentations from all of whom we'll hear more later. But anyway, it's a pleasure to have you at LSE. And the floor, sir, is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Colin, for the generous introduction, as well as <clears throat> to look for uh, organizing. Thank you all for being here. <clears throat> So I'm going to just say a few opening remarks for the discussion that I hope will follow. And I, want to guess, I guess I would say one word about um, oppression, one word about courage, and one word about complicity, mostly in the form of questions. Now, as uh, my previous uh, fellow speakers have outlined, obviously academia includes within itself, despite uh, its presumptions or uh, the fiction that we would like to maintain about academia, its own hierarchies, its own disciplinary uh, mechanisms, and obviously we are not autonomous from as kind of free-floating intellectuals. So my first remark will be directed about regarding the question of education and what it is say about Israel and how is that completely obscured by Western academia for the most part, despite the best efforts of many of us here. Because academia is not only about 
researching and writing and disseminating information and illuminating, but also about erasing and obscuring and justifying injustice. And there is so much of it, as Kumar was just implying, that it's quite tiring. And every time you need to point out the actual facts, the actual reality that no one wants to see, that so many deny, as one of your articles also pointed out. And there's so many denial mechanisms uh, that's very hard to confront all of it all the time. As one of these movies recently, everything at once, all of the time. What is it, what is it called? So you are confronted with that, and it's very hard not to feel overwhelmed. Um, so it's not only you that you are overwhelmed. It's all of us who are overwhelmed and tired of confronting so much bullshit. Now, the first thing to, uh, I want to discuss is the question of how is uh, talking about education in Palestine uh, in the different groupings of the Palestinians having been fragmented into, into different geographical and political and legal categories and areas. What does that tell us about Israel? And how is that informative of what followed uh, since uh, before and after uh, the 7th of October? So if you look at the Palestinians inside Israel, and I'm one of them, you see that there is an education system that is institutionally distinct for Arabs, Palestinians, and Jews inside Israel. It's institutionally segregated. And this segregation education follows the residential segregation and they feed into each other. And they also prevent the social mobility that can occur in the so-called open societies. Now, this is an open fact. This is a fact that has been, you know, there was 15 years ago, there's, I think, a report by Human Rights Watch about second-class citizens, about the education system for the Palestinians inside Israel showing that through the education you can see how they are an underclass, how they are second class. They are not granted uh, equal access to education or equal resources as well as equal opportunities for social mobility and integration and in all the institutions of the economy and the government and society. If you look at the Palestinians in the West Bank, and uh, Reem was mentioning some of the stuff that students at Bir Zayt or other universities face. You also see a glimpse of the apartheid system that is imposed also even more than inside Israel, uh, uh, even more so aggressively in the West Bank and Gaza before the disengagement, in which uh, there is a, a very limited space for a free and uh, 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 productive space for running universities and running education when every now and then the Israeli army can enter BZ University and snatch your students, arrest them. Or the subcontractor for the occupation, the personal authority can arrest one of the teachers, one of the students, because they are critical of the corruption of the personal authority and its collaboration with the Israeli security uh, mechanisms that are only maintaining the apartheid and the unlawful occupation. If you look at the Palestinians in, the, uh, in Lebanon or other refugee camps, you will see again the exclusion of millions of Palestinians from the territory of their homeland. And the attack on UNRWA by Israel is no accident. It predates the 7th of October, as we saw from the days of uh, uh, Donald Trump. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is not the question of security and so on that Israel, because, as I said, they had previous excuses for attacking UNRWA, and the main excuse is UNRWA is the supplier of health and education in refugee camps for millions of Palestinians, including, of, of course, in refugee camps in Gaza, not only in Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. And as such, these are the two main pillars, in addition to subsistence, health and education, are the three, uh, plus subsistence are the three main pillars of social existence and reproduction. This is how social groups maintain their continuity over time. So when Israel is attacking the supplier for health and education in refugee camps around the world, and not only in Gaza, they're also attacking the ability of the refugees, in particular, to maintain the refugee identity, to maintain the education system that tells, they teach them about their history, nurture their identity, and nurture the political project of asserting 
the uh, connection to the homeland and the right to return to the homeland. And finally, when we talk about Gaza specifically uh, in the, since the 7th of October, now we're talking about what we call scholasticide or idiocide the systematic destruction of the, of the educational uh, institution in Gaza, and also the killing of those who can run these institutions, who can teach and provide education in these institutions, in addition, of course, to the systematic destruction of the health sector and those who can provide uh, health. So again, when you destroy the education system, or to try to deprive refugees elsewhere as well from the educational opportunities that allow them to reproduce themselves within the national identity of the Palestinians as a group who, uh, who, whose identity was forged by statelessness, and that's a political condition, but not, you know, refugees are usually a humanitarian category. So we need to insist on the statelessness of the Palestinians, not only their being uh, refugees. So when you consider that the attack on UNRWA, UNRWA becomes an attack on or intended to eliminate the question of Palestine. Because the whole complaint that Israel had even before the 7th of October was that UNRWA is maintaining the refugee identity and consciousness. And they want to disconnect between the earlier refugees, the fathers and the grandfathers, and the current and the future uh, generations. They want to eliminate the question of Palestine because the question of Palestine is essentially a question of refugees and a stateless people. Two-thirds of the Palestinians are refugees. So the attack on UNRWA is within this context. On the scholastic side, the systematic destruction of education is also about not only destroying the past, the museums, the records in these universities, but also destroying the future, that there will be no opportunities for learning and social mobility uh, for generations uh, to come. Now, all of that was known and we have written hundreds and hundreds of pages, many of us here on the panel, about these issues. And we continue to face questions, you know, that Israel is a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, etc. Even though we are products of the education system that is apartheid, that is segregated and uh, under uh, resourced. So again, that's something that we as academic or academic institutions, we need to reflect on these kind of power relations uh, the uh, ways in which the production of knowledge is not balanced, is not neutral, even though all these institutions now are pro pro proclaiming neutrality falsely because the actual production and the actual conduct of these institutions for decades now has not been neutral. So the second, this lead lead me, leads me to the other issue, which is the question of carriage. The carriage of Reem, the carriage of Safa. How do you maintain an educational institution under conditions of apartheid. How do you teach about the lofty abstract values of freedom and equality and the rest of it when your students can just cross the road and then they confront the reality of the boot of the soldiers on their neck or being shot or being arrested and the rest of it? Educational institutions are supposed to be about empowerment, we are told, about uh, social mobility. But how can these students of yours in Bir Zayt and uh, elsewhere, or Gaza under the siege before the genocide, how can they have any chance of being empowered on social mobility when there are the indignities abound in every corner of their lives? How can they be empowered to think of them themselves uh, in, you know, in liberal theory as free and equal citizens when they are told daily by the Israeli system of oppression as well as by Israeli TV, Israeli radio, Israeli media, they are unworthy of freedom, they are unworthy of equality, they are not equal to the new masters of the land. Now of course many teachers of international law in particular around the world had a crisis of faith since the 7th of October because they've noticed the discrepancy between what they teach in class and the actual conduct of the so-called civilized nations or the actual failures and futility of many of the mechanisms of accountability that many of them have worked on 
developed, justified, defended, worked in, etc. But that is kind of discrepancy is, has always been the lot of the Palestinian academic. That kind of discrepancy between the harsh reality, between the reality of injustice and your ability or endeavor to try to maintain some faith that these lofty abstract values, these first principles that we teach our students about, are not a figment of our imagination. They can be real or they can be applicable universally as we are told. And if you are a Palestinian academic inside Israel working for one of these universities, let's say the Hebrew University, how can you maintain a vocation in which you teach about minority rights or international law or any other of these things or women's rights or children's rights when you are in an institution that is complicit in the apartheid, complicit in the apartheid and now complicit in the uh, genocide and this is the case obviously of our friend professor Nader Shilbub Kiborkian who was told recently you can even sign a petition to say something else even though this is the only democracy in the Middle East and the rest of it, right? And that the university is a Zionist university, even though we allow you to be here for 30 years. And the moment you say something we disagree with in a moment of uh, war, in which their children go to war, the professors themselves in reserve duty go to war, the moment you do that, you are excluded, you are snitched at, your, the, the mob, your, your own director, your own uh, head of department unleashes the mob on you and then eventually you get arrested for simply and then interrogated about very complicated academic concepts that even many of us here as academics barely understand but these police officers who barely finished the degree are asking Professor Nadira about the meaning of you know necropolitical uh, capitalism or something like that. <laughs> So again, the reason why I'm asking these questions or is to highlight the courage of so many Palestinians generally, but also Palestinian academics who maintain day in, day out, go to work under these conditions of apartheid, these conditions of unlawful occupation, these are conditions of siege in Gaza for over 16 years. And it's interesting that, you know, many of us here in, in, the, in the Western media hear about the courage of the few Israeli dissidents. And this is highlighted, you know, I'm not discarding the importance of that. But the overemphasis on that, in a way, devalues the mundane courage of so many Palestinians and so many Palestinian academics who, whose life is one of dissidence and one of uh, resisting against all the odds. And this reminds me, this might be a tangent if you allow me. The Financial Times recently a couple of months ago, had an interview with a Palestinian novelist, Palestinian British novelist. And this novelist writes about Palestinian history, about Palestinian trauma. And I thought this is an occasion in which finally someone asked about Palestinian trauma since the 7th of October. All, all we ha had heard is about Israeli tra trauma. And in this one page, you know, lunch with an author page in the Financial Times, uh, indeed trauma is mentioned twice, but it's the Israeli trauma that is mentioned not the Palestinian trauma. So the Palestinian academic was not asked about trauma. Her work about trauma was, uh, trauma was not also highlighted. So this leads me to the conclusion that there is this talk about both sidism and how bad is that. But actually, this is only on the political level, meaning when it comes to the question of political responsibility, there's this discourse that both sides are responsible. But when it comes to actually humanizing only one side is humanized, which is the Israelis, not the Palestinians. Only one side is allowed to be angry, to react in revenge, to be courageous, to be traumatized, while the Palestinians are not. Finally, I want to ask a few questions about complicity following what we have heard from uh, Rafif. How do you res maintain respect to your own academic institution, to your so many fellow academics in the face of their silence over the horror 
over the carnage, when you are alienated in these spaces, when the veneer of tolerance and liberalism quickly evolves into the ugly face of neoliberal authoritarianism in many of these institutions. These institutions have worked for so long, as Rafif indicated, on depoliticizing the student body, depoliticizing the staff. We need to show up from nine to five, we tell you what to do and how to do it. You cannot give us a lot of free labor, but then you are not allowed to actually have a say in the, how we run the institution and how we create the conditions of uh, your own so that affect your own uh, work. A couple of months ago, this institution hosted Benny Morris, this law school. Now, Benny Morris, for those of you who don't know, is someone who uh, justified the ethnic cleansing of 1948. He said that Zionism had an inbuilt element in it, which is the expulsion of the natives, because you can't have a Jewish state in a Palestinian homeland without ex 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 expelling the indigenous population, and that was fine, according to him. The only problem for him at the time was, this is something he said 20 years ago, is that Ben-Gurion, the founders of Israel, the Zionist movement, did not finish the job. And that's why we have issues, like you know, have 20% Palestinian minority inside Israel. If you could have a purity of ethnicity, that would have uh, led to less uh, tensions and better forms of governance. And recently he wrote in the New York Times that even though that he despises Netanyahu in terms of the political spectrum that exists in Israel and within Zionism, he actually agrees with him that we need to, he, Israel needs to go to Rafah and finish the job. So he said finish the job and we should have finished the job in 48. Now we have a, uh, the chance to finish the job in 2024. And then he was invited to LSE because his LSE is an institution in neutral. <laughs> All views supporting genocide or against genocide, for ethnic cleansing, against ethnic cleansing. LSE and other academic institutions here are at arm's length and they don't have a say. So this leads me to say that it's the students who give us hope not the academics. And, uh, you know, the, if you think about um, former students like Rafif, who many years ago started the Israeli Apartheid Weeks in North uh, America, and they were dismissed, and they were attacked, and they were called names. And then two years earlier, the mainstream human rights discourse Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch say this is apartheid. So that's the lesson in which the students can be vindicated sooner or later. And there are times in which all this talk, academic talk about dialogue and research and reflection and peer review should end and the space for action starts. So I would like to thank these students and hopefully they can reclaim the university as a space for students and staff, not for neoliberal authoritarian uh, management. Thank you. Uh, we are we are open to that criticism at the end. Tennessee law, Tennessee law. I mean, I could spend a lot of time explaining that a number of us opposed it. I could refer us to the strength of the student opposition. I could tell you about how dangerous it is to cancel meetings when the invitation is out because then you play into the hands of a particular discourse. But what you said is laying it on the line and we take it. Uh, and it's, it wasn't, in my opinion, our finest moment. Now I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, we've got half an hour left, I think. I, I'm gonna keep you guys on the sidelines for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna say something myself. And then I'm gonna invite a sequence of interventions it's, uh, I've, I've just, uh, this is provoked by, not provoked, inspired by what I've heard. Uh, I've just finished a book on the history of counterterrorism law. 
and one of the key players in all of this is Benjamin Netanyahu. I was reminded of this. Mm. And I first came across him when he was the BBC go-to expert on terrorism. And uh, it's a constructed subject. A lot of this, these perhaps I can say just very briefly, because it's all been done under the, under the cover of counterterrorism. And terrorism is, a, is an invented subject. I have a chapter in my book about Palestine, and it was invented between 1973 or 4 and 1982. And it was invented by conferences, it was invented by academic experts, and suddenly, instead of IRA violence being IRA violence, or vast violence being vast violence, it was international terrorism, and Palestinian violence stopped being uh, the pursuit of self-determination, and stopped being even Palestinian violence. It became some wild example of a global disease, the global war on terror, as it came to be called. And unavoidably, in my opinion, and it's the conclusion to my book, it's about race. It's about race. Every now and again, people make an effort to explain that some white guy who kills a whole bunch of students in America because he, they won't have sex with them, they're trying to explain that that's terrorism. Or every now and again, some police officer arrests some white racist, and we all say, oh, that's great. It's, it's not what it's about. The terrorism law goes with the grain of race. And what is race? I'm not a sociologist. I mean people who are not white. And that's what it's been about from colonial times. <coughs> and so it's the colonial times where it was invented to explain why you could kill the, 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 the peoples fighting for freedom against you. And, 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 and it's survived and amongst the very first replies to the UN after 11 September 2001 were the Israelis who were talking enthusiastically about, guess what, the maintenance of the colonial laws that had been intended to destroy the local people. And they were proud of them. That's my first point. It's adding to the discussion. My second point is leading into the discussion we're going to have now. Uh, I feel that what's going on in Gaza at the moment is the most important event in my adult life in terms of the future. The most important event. I, I, was, I was informed about the situation in 1982 when as a student I, I watched the bombardment of Lebanon and I heard the reports of the siege of Beirut, which this initially resembled, but this is far worse. Because this now stands as not just, although it's primarily, the destruction of the Palestinian people once and for all. And the remarks there about the United Nations were dramatic, dramatic. It hadn't really been one of the points I had thought about. It's also about the destruction of the idea of, of, an, of, of a people who are not part of this Global North game, it's got, and that's why I think Gaza's come to speak to so many people, so much more than, as it were, with respect, Gaza. It's become a kind of symbol of the loss of the facade, the loss of the facade. And it's also, it's also the loss of shame. You see, what's a facade? A facade is to allow us to live with ourselves, despite the injustice. So a facade is very important to our daily lives. And a facade is the possibility of exposure, which is a source of an opportunity for change. But if you lose the facade, you lose the facade, you lose shame. You lose shame. And what we see a glimpse in Israel today is what a shameless Western power is like. And if, we, if it occurs and we go on to the Norwegians and so on helping to build Gaza back with a few UN people It'll take 14 years, they think, to remove the rubbish, so or the, the debris. But if it goes back to that, and, and Mr. Mr. Whoever he is in America who brokers their deal gets some sort of Nobel Prize, if it goes back to that, impunity will have entered the Western lexicon. And so if that happens, what is the killing of a few refugees seeking to enter the United Kingdom? What is it? What is it? Who cares? Because the bar of barbarity has now been raised so high that anything will go and so I think that's why it's so important. It's come at a moment in our culture which is kind of slightly preparing for this anyway. And if, it's not, if it is not tamed and if there is not legal, political retribution and so on, the field is open for the transformation of the world that we thought we lived in. I feel, I feel immensely 
strongly about that. Now, you've heard, uh, I mean, a cumulative set of presentations, uh, just quite powerful. I know that the reaction might be just to absorb them, but I, I'm going to put you under ever so slight mild pressure, remembering we have our two audiences, but remembering also that scattered in the more remote audience might be a few people extremely keen to help us change the story. And so I'm minded listening to what we've heard. Uh, please be careful not to give them another story because we haven't given them another story. We've given them facts. But there's a tremendous interest in diverting our conversation into crimes or into allege this or allege that. So let's not give those people a special welcome, those people watching very carefully, to spot, to spot the deviation. Uh, let's not give them the chance. So I'm going to be a rigorous chair from that point of view, but I have total confidence that we are, all of us, aware of what I am talking about. Uh, and for the tape, as they say on the shows, uh, I treat everybody with respect, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, can, we, can, we have, can we have somebody, I mean, I'm looking for contributions, additions, the United Nations, human rights, what should academics do? A lot of us in the room are academics, devastating critique, cumulatively. But when I was listening, I was thinking, who are the free academics? Are the free academics in the rubble of Gaza? who've maintained integrity and spirit, and are the trapped academics, the people with their research grants, and their big tenure jobs, and their publications. I don't know. So let's, let's kick off. Luke, Dr. Luke, who will be mentioned later in dispatches, has got a microphone. Uh, and I'm going to wait. I'm one of those guys who wait for a long time for an intervention, so don't think you can avoid it. And we have a person scratching his head, but possibly putting his hand up. <laughs> now, what we're going to do here, we're going to do here, is we're going to take your name, affiliation, if you care to give it. If you don't want to give your name, don't, but just tell me you don't want to give it. And then it's, uh, it's an observation or a question, but I'm not going back to you guys for a bit. So try and remember what's said. So. Um, my name's Max. I'm a uh, master's student at the LSE Law School. I've just come back from Ireland. Oh. The student movement <laughs> there. <laughs> Um, in addition to divestment, they're also calling for Irish universities to make scholarships available to Palestinian students and to offer positions to Palestinian academics. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how useful that is. Um, I know Rafif mentioned the importance of maintaining education in the Palestinian mode. Should those universities be seeking to support that and assist in Palestine in addition to that? Or just to hear those thoughts. Right, very good, Max. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. You're going to have to do a little bit of mental work here to try and remember things. Uh, of course, I, 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 I nearly grimaced when I heard, oh, yeah, here goes the Irish accent. So, uh, uh, and it allows me to say the Irish contribution in my country has made me very proud. I'm normally anti nationalist, to be honest with you. But my goodness. Uh, next up, great, great. Hi, name, um, uh, affiliation, um, and my name question is Dr. Vidya Kumar. I am a colleague and honored to be a colleague. Dr. Lydia Sultani at SOAS uh, Law School. Um, I'm just going to make a brief uh, intervention and plea. Um, I would like to speak to those academics, not only in the UK, but across the world, who said nothing about what's happening in Gaza. And I would ask them to change their minds and to speak up. Now, there are many reasons people may have had difficulties speaking out on Gaza. And of course, there are some um, reasons um, that people have uh, you know, offered as to why they've been silent. However, um, I do want to say that um, there are risks to speaking up. Um, and uh, I think now is the time to take those risks. I think it's, this is such um, a travesty, and uh, I don't even want, you know, actually that's the wrong word. word. Um, this is an absolute abomination. This is um, probably the most shocking thing I've ever, I've ever had to uh, witness or be alive for in my entire life, so I feel exactly like Connor. Um, and, and I think now is the time to speak up. Now is the time to take those risks. All of us who have been speaking up are taking those risks, and there are costs to it, but we have to absorb those costs because this is too important a moment to be silent. So, so, um, and our cost, the cost that we're experiencing here is nothing 
like uh, the costs of what's happening in Palestine. Just, in Palestine. just probing it a bit as we keep the mic just for a second. What, speaking of, what does it mean? Does it mean talking, lecturing on it? Does it mean trying to change the curriculum to reflect it? Does it mean going on marches? You know, just to push a little bit on, because there'll be people listening. What do you mean, what should, as a I, I love do? your question because all of the answers are yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's great, so you've given me all the answers to the question. Thank you so much, Connor, and everything, every, everything you can think of for solidarity. Um, I'm passing the mic back. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And we have, uh, we're going to take, no, let's, let's see how we're doing, yeah. No, no, it's going to you, it's going to you. <laughs> and then, sir, it's going to you. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, my name is Malavika, and I'm a PhD student at the LSE Law School. Um, I guess I just wanted to drill down a little bit on these costs, uh, the costs of speaking up, because uh, I think it's important for academic freedom. We heard a lot about uh, the costs in Gaza, and it was, you know, yeah, my solidarity is with you is feels so limiting to say that, but uh, I'd like I'd be, I'd be really curious, especially by the more you know tenured academics, uh, more senior academics. What are these costs? I would like to understand because I think a lot of the fear about speaking up is wrapped up in that bogeyman, right? I think even for the student protests, the reason that I feel like and again, kudos to all the students in the encampment right now who are you know yesterday and day before as well at the rally. I think there's these fears, and we know what it's uh, about for people on visas, which is expulsion, speaking out. If you're not a member, you know, it's very closely tied to questions of citizenship, uh, residency, state power, and so on. But I think more broadly, there's also silencing, getting fired, that kind of thing. It took me back to, I think, Graeber had this great uh, article called It's Not a Tenure Case, when he got kicked out of Yale, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious, what are these costs? Because I think having a more clinical discussion on what they are also helps invite people to make that determination whether they can take it or not but also you know put pressure on those costs like who are these people who are firing other people or silencing you know what is not you know who are collapsing categories of, of you know hate and into proper academic free conversation so i guess that's my query and invitation thank you that's, that's terrific and we reflect on on that as we move across here because of course, it depends on your, on your seniority and so on, and your visa, as you rightly said. What mystifies me is established academics with tenure who don't say anything. And it's their field. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's the point of tenure? So it's, it's that sense of being trapped in your own constrained mind. Mm -hmm. And breaking free of that seems to be difficult for people. Uh, but we, we hear from others, and we certainly hear from our colleagues, UK-based on that one. And we've got you, sir, reminding me of who you are and a, a short intervention. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, thank all speakers. Uh, I am an Algerian architect and planner. And I would like to add to all these speakers. I always believe that academics are more human and uh, <coughs> more honest. But I don't think that in the case of Gaza, they are. They're not honest. They're not human. They're not less than 50% uh, and sometimes they say, believe that they are hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the other thing I believe as well, I think it's a time to talk about actions rather than discussions. The Israelis, they believe in action. They don't believe in talks and listening. But that is the problem now, after how many months or after this, we are seeing I'm, I'm really going to be, I'm going to come, come back to you guys briefly, I don't want to lose the audience, but what kind of action is really interesting? Uh, because there are moral, perhaps for many, but also strongly tactical objections to political violence, you know, so what kind of thing? I'm myself heading towards the disinvestment academic boycott route because in a way the government can't compel us to buy stuff from the occupied territories, for example. So there's ways in which we can do things, but I'd be very interested in what people think are those actions. I'm not inviting you, sir, tempting though I am to invite you to talk about Algeria. We said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. 
Don't mm. forget the special relationship between mm. Hanseatic and Palestine. Mm. Yeah. Indeed, I mm. absolutely. Now, introduce yourself, as Dr. Fatima, but tell us, tell everybody who you are for, Hi, for people I'm at home. I've known Asparin forever, the LSEs, so, yeah, I've never wondered, yeah, I just like, stayed here forever. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, somewhat, I think sometimes we're a bit um, reluctant to talk about it as academics because it's a bit embarrassing to talk about, but I want to talk a little bit about academic grifting. So um, the people who've made entire careers out of the misery of Palestinians, um, or the misery of you know the wider Middle East. I'm an, I'm I'm not Palestinian. I'm an Arab, but you know I've I've seen this a, a lot. People who and there are, and there are people I know who are writing right now, uh, book proposals, grant proposals, um, you know academic funding bids on this, and they haven't taken a single moral stance. So I would like to call for us. We, we all kind of know who they are, but we don't really want to you know, say. So let's shun them academically. Let's not cite them. Let's not center them. Let's, let's, let's move away. Um, and I, I know it's, it's not the things we like to talk about in these conferences because it's, it seems petty, but you know, let's be petty. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to the panel. I'm reminded that I got a very long email from, I knew it was going to be long, and he, he was a very obviously Jewish person, very distinguished professor, and my heart sank, and when I opened it, I, I, I had an experience of joy, because he was so supportive of something I'd done, but he said something in particular, I don't know, would you have avoided? He said, thank goodness you named names, and you didn't, and no, I think no. wisely, I have to say, I may have been Jodine, but it's fascinating how he saw immediately what you've talked about. Uh, the naming of names is an interesting device and is destabilizing. I'm going to go to the panel. There's, I, I don't know who, uh, we'll take Max, I'm going to control you quite carefully now, apologies. <laughs> Max's point was, I think Rafiq was sort of going in your direction. Uh, this was the point about scholarships. Uh, yeah, and the Irish initiative yes, and so forth. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we should juxtapose these things against each other. Um, I was speaking more about some of the think tanks that are now putting forward ideas for the rebuilding of Gaza universities with complete external intervention, uh, not talking to the universities in Gaza whatsoever. I think right now this is a very delicate time where these universities should be offering scholarships to Palestinian students, but also residencies to Palestinian academics. We haven't seen any of that. Those programs came online like that when it was to do with the Ukraine. A lot of the sanctuary uh, scholarships that we have in many of the universities in England still do not accept Palestinian students, and the Home Office is not giving visas to these students either. So there's, there's a much larger structural problem happening around not accepting Palestinian students, and that has to do with racism. So absolutely, most of the encampments are asking for scholarships. This is not the first time this has happened, uh, if people remember, because this is not the first assault on Gaza. There was 2008, and there were occupations across the country, and there were scholarships at that time that were given. Uh, the problem is the, the immigration system <coughs> and where we're at right now with, the, with what's happening around migration is so horrific in this country that even that is difficult to ask for. But certainly, I wouldn't juxtapose these things against each other. And the more scholarships we can get, and residencies, and any ways of support, um, but that that also has to include the funding mechanisms. Part of the problem that's happening in Ireland, for example, and I was just there, is many of the people coming in from Gaza are being considered as external students and having to pay fees externally while they're in direct provision. Um, that doesn't make sense. You can't say. You know, you support the people of Gaza and then think they're going to pay 22,000 euros as refugees in direct provision. Um, so there's a lot of like, work yeah. to be done right now around this scholarship issue. Good, okay, I'm going to go to Nima. I think I'll ask you about Mal's point about the costs of, of, of speech. What are these costs? For speaking up, you know, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean sometimes I think these costs are more imaginary than real. Because, uh, you know, I'm not discarding uh, the fact that some have faced repercussions for uh, speaking up. But I think there are enough of us who uh, have turned out just fine, despite 
these, uh, you know, uh, despite speaking up. Because if you think of it uh, over the long term, uh, as a student, you'll say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say anything till I finish my PhD, get a decent job, and then I will speak up. And then you get the job and say, well, I need five, six years to become tenure or permanent, so I'm going to stay silent. And then you become a tenured professor, and they say, you know, maybe I want I'll a grant. Be, be, be a grant or be a dean or a head of department, <laughs> be an institutionally powerful, can do things. So you end up being, uh, you know, it's like all these congressmen who speak up uh, about the Zionist lobby only after they retire. So, and the same with academics. Many of them uh, lose the opportunity to actually exercise their, the, the, the truth of their uh, vocation and the uh, potential power of their vocation while they can do it, uh, while they are active in spaces in which they can influence. Obviously, when you speak up, you lose some opportunities. Uh, so you don't, you know, turn up being a, a professor at Harvard Law School, but you know, so is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so long as. <laughs> so we know the pain of the dean of Harvard that never happened. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that did not sound bitter. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. But the point is uh, that uh, you know, even someone like Duncan Kennedy who uh, taught a class about Palestine uh, many years ago before he retired. He was also, even though he's kind of a uh, institutionally secured, etc., he was warned about the repercussions uh, for teaching uh, and in being involved in that kind of issue. But still, you, despite some you know, uh, skirmishes, you, uh, you know, get up just fine. So I think there's a lot of uh, talk about costs uh, that somewhat uh, justifies simply being silent. Yeah. And if you stay silent in a way that betrays the uh, optimal uh, version of our vocation, and that also leads me to the question of you know, hypocrisy, etc. This is not about Gaza. This is a kind of a more generalized condition in which sometimes, uh, perhaps in many times, there's a discrepancy between the uh, vocation or the intellectual interest or the teaching career and between actual conduct, between theory and practice, if you want. Uh, I know uh, people who wrote uh, five books about uh, Karl Marx, but when the fractionals or the cleaners at the university want a little bit of more money, they are against them because they're serving in some managerial capacity. So that discrepancy is something we need to confront uh, beyond guys. Yeah. I'm going to stop you, but the link between that and neoliberal, to use a cliche, is very interesting to come through today. It's a tricky one. I'd like to get another round in. I may, I may fail. What for our Julian friend? The devastating question to the two people from, from Palestine, living in Palestine and from Gaza. What, what action? I'm, 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 I'm making it impossible. I'm saying, what action? What action? Bring kick kickoff. Uh, let me first, I, I just want, I would like to answer oh, the question. Oh, absolutely, yes. This question and, and about yeah. scholarships. Uh, I mean, by, uh, on 7th of October, uh, 555 students uh, lost uh, the ability to go uh, abroad in exchange and scholarship. They uh, were not allowed to leave Gaza, and hence they lost their opportunities uh, to, to do so. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing, scholarship does not mean intervention. Scholarships are scholarships for students, individuals, who want to pursue studies. And as uh, uh, you know, they all, uh, or most of them, they return back if there is uh, something to return to. Uh, uh, this is one thing. The other thing in relation to uh, um, uh, academia and actually the rebuilding of the uh, educational system in Gaza. Uh, as I mentioned, there is an initiative at Birzeit. There is a it's called Rebuilding uh, Hope. Uh, it's not just about uh, teaching students. Also, it's also about uh, claiming the ownership of the Palestinian educational system. 
it is the Palestinians who own this uh, system. It's not open to everybody to intervene and uh, to work uh, as they like uh, and to impose their own uh, restrictions and uh, ideologies and uh, on us. Uh, we have experienced in the before uh, such uh, uh, things in relation to curriculums. Uh, Israelis always claim that the Palestinian curriculum system need to be changed. The EU uh, accepted the changes made by the Palestinian, and then the, again they refused it because the Israelis claimed that there are other things to be changed in the curriculum. So we are aware, and we work uh, 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 and think about all these things, and we think that it's important to think of the rebuilding is as an opportunity to impose and to uh, keep the Palestinian uh, narrative and story and history and future and to let not to let uh, anybody intervene in it because this is an opportunity also to such uh, uh, intervention so uh, this is an academic institutional awareness by universities uh, uh, everywhere uh, uh, and uh, we've been doing that for years and I think we hope to carry on doing that uh, uh, for the future uh, as well. Uh, in relation of what's, uh, what needs to, be ha to happen, I think, uh, first of all, people need to be courageous, uh, need to talk, uh, to speak, uh, uh, to write, uh, to think about what is happening in Palestine. It's important, I mean, the students are moving, but academics are not. So it's important to uh, have an academic movement like the one the students have in different ways and different shapes. Uh, it's important, as we mentioned before, to divest, to call for boycott, and to dislink, uh, uh, especially academic boycott with any Israeli uh, uh, academics and institutions in particular. It's, uh, it's important also to uh, open a discussion with Palestinian institutions. Uh, that's an important aspect because if it is uh, it is important to see and discuss uh, and uh, uh, things with the Palestinian institutions and to try to work with them in that uh, regard but most importantly uh, is any political action and political action could be uh, from demonstrating, putting pressure on politicians. It's important not only to rebuild uh, or to talk about the destruction of Gaza, but also to talk about seizing the fire in Gaza, stopping this war, ending it. Uh, I mean, nobody, now we're talking about rebuilding uh, because we're talking about the total destruction of Gaza. But what about stopping this war? I don't think it will stop soon. I mean, we have to be aware that if uh, the world is not going to stop the Israelis, they're, not, they're going to carry on doing what they're doing for years. What is going to stop them? I mean, the scale of it is going to be different. The scale of it is going to be reduced, but they will carry on doing so. I mean, look what happened in Rafah. Rafah is an example of the fact that they will carry on destroying uh, Gaza again and again. And uh, the end of it is uh, a collective work of the whole world, of the people who believe uh, in justice in general. And solidarity is part of that uh, as well. Okay, thank you very much. You're going to have the last word before me. Yes. There you are. You've got the last word. And I was slightly reprimanded for asking only one question about action. But thank you for the action answer and the rest. Fantastic. Over to you. Okay. Um, so I would say two points about what to do. Um, currently in social media, uh, I know this is kind of a brave step, uh, in social media they're having uh, um, a hashtag to block out influencers who did not speak up about the genocide. And uh, followers are saying, we made you popular because we are following you. So we are unfollowing you because you are unethical. How about academics? Mm -hmm. Who made them academics? Stop breeding for them, citing them. Let them feel that they are on the wrong side of history. This is a brave thing, but this is, would be especially among academics who can't take the step. Students, they don't want to attend the class. And for the academics who are standing on the right side of history with uh, the Palestinian cause, I would like call them 
to not to let the student alone in their movement. Stand with them. Be with them. Be on their sides. Really, like, meeting the students downstairs, like, were, like, hard feeling for me. I think as uh, Gazans, we lost hope in humanity. But seeing those movements erupted all around the world, it's kind of lit, lit some hope get into and we start to believe that maybe we made something, maybe. So I would invite all of you to think what you can do. That's a, great, that's a beautiful way to end it. No. Yeah, why not? Why not? I'm wrapping it up. Thank you very much. Sorry we only have one round, but we, we, we do need to play fair by the team and we're going to go. And, and I want to just say, we, we missed Dr. Mesna Kato, who's out doing tremendously important work in Cambridge, dealing with the, uh, uh, the, the, camp, the encampment there. We send her felicitations if they're, if they're, if they're watching. Uh, and, and also, uh, I want a special shout out for Mazen, Mazri, who was instrumental in producing this stunning uh, platform. Uh, his, his partner, I think, has had a baby, is that right? And the baby was born apparently yesterday, and he's so negligent in his duties that he's taken the day off. <laughs> I must say that I'm a very old school, and he's a man, isn't he? He didn't actually physically have it. But, uh, at very least, Mazda, I hope you're watching. Uh, and uh, thank you for making this what it was. And the, uh, for many of you, unknown mystic, almost Dr. Luke, referred to throughout as though he was some sort of quack from the medical world. Can I just get him to stand up? Luke McDonald. Stand up! Stand up! Luke, 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 Luke McDonald, who is at the lowest point in our post Benny Morris phase. And I, I thought we couldn't show our face, I have to say to you, in public again on the issue of Palestine. Luke McDonald said to me, This is an opportunity. And I said, Don't be ridiculous. And it's an opportunity that has been produced, the Catholics would call it penance, but it has produced strong LSE law support. And let me just say to you as we finish, strong LSE support for an event like this, the like of which I have not seen in a university environment in the last 10 months, and more of it might change our culture. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to now remind you, I'm sorry, that I'm going to guide our colleagues to meet the encampment We'll be down to you in a minute, folks. And I'm going to ask you all to play fair by LSE and not linger particularly. They're quite nervous, understandably. And I want to thank you guys for coming as well and for your excellent contributions and solidarity. Your solidarity in attending. A final round of applause for them. Thank you.